Hi, everybody. So for Earth Day, I thought I would record and upload my master's te technical paper information. I am just about to wrap up my Master of Fisheries and Aquatic Sciences at the University of Florida. And my technical paper, presentation, defense, all that stuff was on the effects of plastics on corals and other coral reef invertebrates. So in this first part, which I will link the other parts down below, but in this first part, we are just going to get into the kind of plastic abundance concentrations in marine environments and the importance of coral reef ecosystems. So let me just share my screen here. All right, so to introduce you guys to plastics, they come in a variety of sizes. So macroplastics are anything 25 millimeters in length or greater. Mesoplastics are anywhere between five and 25 millimeters. Microplastics are one tenth of a micrometer to five millimeters. And then nanoplastics are anything smaller than microplastics. And then these plastics come in a variety of structures. Uh, the most common ones for microplastics are fibers and beads. And they are made up of varying compositions. So PVC, polystyrene, nylon, acrylic, PET, and a whole bunch of other stuff. It's not switching. Okay, so plastic abundance in the marine environment. There are over 300 million tons of plastics produced in 2010 across 192 coastal countries. About 5.3 to 14 million tons of these plastics will ultimately end up in the ocean. However, the actual estimates of those numbers are one to three orders of magnitude greater than that mainly because these studies left out data from China and Singapore, which are major plastic polluters. And then 1.15 to 2.4 million tons of plastics enter the marine environment annually from rivers. 79% of plastic waste ultimately ends up in the landfills or the environment. And then 60 to 80% of marine litter is plastics. And of those plastics, 92% are macroplastics, which are like those plastic bags, um, plastic straws, plastic water bottles, all, um, fishing gear. And we'll get more into that later. And then before I move on, I do want to add that a lot of the plastic pollution from China is actually originates in, originates in the States. Up until a few years ago, the U.S. would ship a lot of our rubbish over to China and other countries in the area, and they would rummage through it and reuse what they could, but a lot of the times they just dumped it all over there. So it seems like it's coming from there, but a lot of the times it originates in the U.S. So plastics are found in every body of water. Every marine environment that's ever been tested for plastics, they found it. Plastic can transport to far regions like the deep sea and polar regions where they're, it's pretty much uninhabited because it can move via the ocean winds and currents. However, there are relatively high concentrations of plastics in coastal areas. Uh, since those tend to be densely populated as well. And then coral reefs and other benthic ocean habitats, especially the deep sea, can be microplastic sinks. So just a, a bunch of plastic accumulates there and will kind of stay around. And then there are a bunch of different abundance variations because plastic abundance really does differ between marine environments. So the maximum recorded that I found was 25,000 particles of plastic 
per kilogram of seawater. So that can be little microplastics. It can be microplastic B and then one like plastic bag, stuff like that. And then multiple studies in the Maldives and or Maldives and the South China Sea found anywhere from 44 to 1,127.5 plastic items per kilogram of seawater. And then one study in the Indo-Pacific was looking at macroplastics larger than 55 milliliters in length. So remember, macroplastics are technically anything greater than 25 millimeters, but they were looking specifically 55 millimeters or larger. And that they had 0 0.4 to 25.6 macroplastics per 100 meters squared. Overall, in the Asia Pacific shallow water reef environments, which are home to 55.5% of the world's coral reefs, there have been abundance estimates of 11.1 billion plastic items. And this is the study that excluded information from China and Singapore. So there's a lot missing, which means it's likely an underestimation. And then by 2025, so this study was released in 2018. I believe the 11.1 billion is from 2010. You'll actually see it on the next slide. But by 2025, which is just four years from now, they estimate that it will be over 15.7 billion plastic items in just that small environment. And plastic abundance is always increasing, especially after COVID, when a lot of people have been eating at, uh, have been well, getting takeout that uses a lot more, especially all those little condiment packages. Or, and they've been, instead of shopping in person, they've been ordering stuff off Amazon, which obviously, you know, it's hard. You can't really go out right now. Maybe, I mean, now more so than a year ago when I know here in Georgia we were under lockdown or well, stay at home orders. But yeah, it's definitely increasing a lot. And so here's that map. Um, this is from a United Nations Environmental Program report. So on the top, you see the estimated levels of plastic debris in 2010. And in the red box is the Asia Pacific Reef area, home of 55.5% of coral reefs. And you'll see from 2010 to 2005, how much that increases, especially in those areas. Like look how much darker India got. That is pretty scary. So sources of marine plastics, these include packaging materials, river and land runoff, direct dumping, lost cargo, vehicle tire dust, industrial pellet spills, road, building and marine paint, municipal water drainage, and improperly managed plastic litter. And there are a bunch more. To go into more specifics on textiles, I thought it was really interesting that over 1.9 thousand microplastic fibers are released per clothing item per wash. So every time you're doing laundry, that's really seeing a lot of fibers. And that's something that we just, we really can't help. So that, it kind of freaks me out that like, there's some things you just almost seems like we can't do to fix that problem. And then in cosmetics, so, in 2009, in the United States, 290 tons of polyethylene microbeads were added to liquid soap products. And then in the European Union, every year, they add around 787 tons of cosmetic microbeads to rinse off personal care products. And then an additional 595 to 1,235 tons in leave-on products. Another major source of marine plastics is ghost gear, which is any intentionally or accidentally discarded fishing gear. This can include nets, traps, pots, floats, marker buoys, ropes, and lines, and this contributes 705 tons of plastic marine litter per year. And then for aquaculture, Agriculture facilities tend to use a lot of synthetic polymers in their equipment, 
and a number of them are open to stare freshwater or marine. Either way, it will likely end up in the marine environment. And a lot of these facilities are near shore. So it releases the chance of incidental release of plastics and other things like disease into the marine environment. And those can also get into there, especially open system. So coral reefs are super important communities. Over 500 million people depend on healthy reef ecosystems. And I believe it's something like 279 million people have, depend on coral reef communities for their primary source of livelihood. And then reefs provide numerous amounts of ecosystem services. These so supporting services include biodiversity, habitat, and structural complexity, the latter two of which increase local biomass. Regulating ecosystem services include water quality regulation, coastal protection from storms and erosion, and biogeochemical cycling. So that would be like the nitrogen cycle. It helps facilitate that. And then provisioning ecosystem services benefit fisheries and tourism industries, which are each worth billions of dollars. At, um, and these coral reef communities contribute like foods, goods, sources of income for those. And then the marine aquaculture trade and um, the marine aquarium trade and aquaculture industries are other industries that benefit from the provisions they get from coral reef communities. And then cultural, cultural core reef ecosystem services promote anthropogenic and social, anthropogenic, so like human social and spiritual connections. So like how we connect with nature. Like when you go paddle boarding, you kind of, you must, if you go paddle boarding often, then it's probably because you feel a kind of connection with the environment and it just makes you feel good. And that's, considered a cultural ecosystem service. It's an aesthetic quality, it's a spiritual connection, it's really interesting. Um, so not just like paddleboarding or kayaking, but there's also scuba diving, snorkeling, glass bottom boat tours, um, all form different forms of ecotourism fall under cultural ecosystem services. And then indirect contributions to ecotourism is by coral reefs is how they protect the shorelines, which can lead to calm water and sandy beaches. So if you think about Moana, which is always the first thing that pops into my head, beyond the reef is when the waters got rough. But within the lagoon on the island side of the reef, the waters were calm. There was gorgeous, there was also gorgeous corals in there and marine life. And it was a very pretty beach. It was animated, but it was very pretty. And then, okay, so coral reefs also play a role in traditions in coastal cultures. So in Hawaii, oh, Hawaii, Hawaii, there is a social tradition that centers around the sharing, the gathering and sharing of fish which is due in part to the coral reef communities. And it just brings the community together, creates stronger bonds amongst them. And then lastly, coral reefs provide many opportunities for reach, research and environmental education. Structural complexity is a major part of coral reefs and how they're great for us um, and just the environment in general. So structural complexity is the biotic and abiotic three-dimensional structure of an ecosystem. It is positively correlated with total coral cover, especially branching corals, which are stuff like the elkhorn corals and staghorn corals. And more structural complexity is also positively correlated with species biomass and biodiversity and the forming of mega habitats, which allow species to fill new niches and thus create a wider array of species. They more structurally complex reefs also provide enhanced recovery from disturbances like offshore hurricanes. 
and they structural complexity is the foundation for all these ecosystem services more structurally complex reefs tend to be in better condition better health and this allows for more animals which benefits the fisheries and tourism industries and also provides more coastal protection so i believe that is this it for part one yes so thank you guys for watching part two will be the effects of these plastics on corals and other coral reef invertebrates like sea urchins and crabs. And then the third part will be kind of critiques and future research, um, just stuff that I've noticed in these studies and things I think we should know more about. And then part four is my favorite part, that will be the conclusion as well as what we can do to minimize our personal plastic waste. So again, I will leave those linked down below. If you want to share this, it will help get the word out more. And I know the environment and myself will really appreciate that. And yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Please give it a thumbs up.